All right, thank you, Rob. So the memory verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, look at verse 12. For as the body is one. The title of the sermon this morning is The Body is One. The body is one and hath many members and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. We're speaking to, today about the church, about the church being this one body. And that makes each one of you one of the members of this one body. Okay, so we know how important our members are of, of our one body, right? Our hands, our feet, we see all this stuff read about in this chapter and then it illustrates that with being a member of a church, being someone that's here, that's physically here in a local congregation and how we can serve one another and use the spiritual gifts that God has given us. Now let's start off with verse number 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Remember, Paul is writing to this messed up church, the Corinthian church. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Okay, we're changing topics now. Things have changed over the next couple of chapters. There's going to be a big emphasis on these spiritual gifts and how we can serve one another with these gifts. Now, I don't hear a lot of preaching. I'll be honest with you guys. I don't hear a lot of preaching from churches of our type on these chapters. Okay? Because, I, I'll tell you why straight away. Because there's a fear of sounding like a charismatic Pentecostal. Because the charismatics have taken these passages about the spiritual gifts and, you know, the, the crazy things that they do. The slain in the spirits, the, the falling on, on, the, on the floor and, and, you know, frothing out the mouth and speaking in, in gibberish and all this stuff they call spiritual gifts. And they turn to passages like this and say, see, you know, we have scriptural support for what we do. And yet, you know, I don't want to spend this chapter, I, I don't want to spend this chapter going through the Pentecostal charismatic movement, Okay. Maybe chapters 13 and 14, I'll cover that in a little bit more detail. But I just want to get that out of the way straight away. What they do is not what this passage is teaching about. Not what any of the scriptures are teaching about, okay? What they do. There are spiritual gifts in effect still today, but then there are many spiritual gifts that are not in effect anymore today, okay? Now, some people call what, what I believe, they, they would call me a uh, cessation, cessationalist, cessationist, cessation. Cessationist. I'm not sure what it is. Basically, we believe that some of these spiritual gifts are no longer applicable today. They were applicable from the time of Pentecost. They were applicable for the time of the apostles and the early church. And something that might differ me from some other independent Baptists, I actually believe some of these spiritual gifts will also be applicable at the end times. And I'll cover that a little bit later on uh, to you, a bit later as we go through this chapter. But notice, Paul writes about the spiritual gifts and he says, I, would not want, I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to understand what these spiritual gifts are for. Why is he emphasizing this point to this church? Is because, again, this church was so divided. This church had their favorite preachers. You know, they, they, uh, they, they looked down upon others. They had great sin in the church and they weren't taking care of business. And the whole purpose of these spiritual gifts is that they would edify the church. They would edify one another. They would be able to show love and serve one another. Look at verse number two. You know that ye were Gentiles. So again, this church is a Gentile church. It's not made up of Jews. Okay, we looked at that last week. It's not, you know, yet the Old Testament, um, you know, uh, forefathers, the Old Testament saints are their fathers, even though they're not Jews. We saw that last week, remember? But it says here, look, that no, you know that ye were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. So in the past, in time past, they worshipped idols. But now that they're saved, now that they're a church, they worship the one true God of the Bible. Okay? Now because they worship the one true God, verse number 3, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. Okay? So straight away, the first thing I want you to take out of this, this verse here is that if you find someone that says Jesus is cursed, okay, or that is not the one true God, then that is not coming from the Spirit of God. Okay? That is coming from a false God. That is coming from a false spirit. You do not want to take any teaching or direction from people that do not at least uphold Christ as God, who do not at least refer to God as the Lord God. So you would ignore people like the Mormons. You would not listen to people like the Jehovah Witnesses, for example, because they do not put Christ 
at the right place. But then verse number three continues, and that no man can say, uh, sorry, yeah, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Okay, now the, the question is, well, can people say that Jesus is the Lord even without the Holy Ghost? Yes, they can. Okay, but this is one way to know which spirit not to listen to. Okay, the ones that call Jesus accursed. You know, Judaism calls Jesus accursed. They believe right now Jesus is burning in hell in his own excrement. Okay, that, they call Jesus accursed, but they do not have the Spirit of God. Okay, they are not God's chosen people. They don't even have the Spirit of God. Okay, so you would not want to listen to, to these false religions that call Jesus accursed or do not refer to him as the Lord. And, and that disgusts me that Baptists, independent Baptists, will take teachings from Judaism and teach their church and say, well, the rabbis believe this. Judaism believe Who cares? They don't have the Spirit of God. Okay? You, won't, you don't listen to these people. You don't bring that kind of teaching into the church. Okay? We are led by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Verse number four. Verse number four. Now, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. So, whether you like to accept this or not, and I'll tell you now, if you're saved and you're a member of the one body of the church, God has given you a spiritual gift, or maybe, maybe more than one gift, okay? Now, there are diversities of gifts. There are diversities of talents. There are different things that you can uh, 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 serve in this church, different ways. But even though you have, there are diversities of gifts, it says, but, we're, but the, ones, the same spirit. It's the same Spirit of God that gives us these gifts, okay? So you should never think of, wow, this person has a great gift of whatever. You know, I wish I was like that. No, you have your own gifts, okay? And they're just as important, and they're given by the same Spirit of God, okay? Verse number five. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. That same Lord is Jesus Christ. There are differences of administrations, that's where we get the word, you know, it's the word administration and the word ministry are, very, are, are pretty much identical. I mean, it's kind of in there, administrations, the ministry, okay? So the different ministries of the church, there are, di there are different ministries of the church, and yet it's the same Lord that we serve, right? The same God that we serve. And, you know, while I'm gone for this week and a half, you know, a lot of the ministries, a lot of the things that we do in the church, I kind of do, Okay? And the reason I do it is I don't ask a lot from you guys. I don't want to put a burden on you guys. I know some of you travel far. I know a lot of you guys work Monday to Friday. And I don't have a full-time job. So, I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm, the, I'm the pastor. I'm, I'm the bishop of this church. I'm happy to serve in this church. I'm happy to do different things. You know, I'm, I'm happy to set up the camera and, and all the different things that go on, you know, uh, uh, with the church. But, hey, I'm going to be away for a week. That means a few of you other guys are going to have to step up and go, hey, I, I need to fill some boots around here. You know, what can I do to help serve the church? Okay? We all have different ministries. Okay? The Lord has given us all different ministries to serve one another. You know, whether that's even just organizing food or just whatever it takes to have the church organized and running day to day. But there's one ministry that we all have. Okay? That's the ministry of reconciliation. It's not just a select group of people's job to preach the gospel to the community. It's everybody's job, okay? And I know not everybody can, can physically knock doors and walk the streets, okay? But even in your own life, just whatever opportunities that you have in your life, you ought to be seen, hey, how can I preach the gospel to my friends and my neighbors? How can I preach the gospel? How can I see these doors opened? How can I learn, okay, and, and be part of the work of this church? Be part of the ministry that God has given you, okay? So we all have the ministry of reconciliation. We all have the ministry of preaching the gospel. And again, this is a big mistake a lot of churches do, right? They'll say, well, I serve in the choir. I serve in the church choir. I serve in the Sunday school ministry or whatever. Whatever, whatever ministries different churches have. So I don't need to preach the gospel. No, that's, <laughs> that, it's, you know, <laughs> the ministry of reconciliation is to everybody, Okay. And I would rather not have any ministries that take up our time if we can just focus on getting people saved. Okay? Now, if we as a church, after a year or so, as we're operating going and, and we're doing the work, then maybe we can add some further ministries within the church. I don't have a problem with that. Okay? But I, I always, if we're going to add ministries to this church, we can never neglect the soul winning. We can never neglect the ministry of reconciliation. That comes first above everything else. 
Look at verse number 6. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Now, operations are the workings or the impact of, of service, I suppose. You could look at it that way. Just, just the operations of the church, okay? We all have uh, different... You know, one preacher might, might uh, be a bit more powerful or might be a little bit more knowledgeable than another preacher. There are different workings. There is there a different outpouring of the work of the service that is done in the church. But again, it's the same God which worketh all in all. You should never get to the point is, I prefer that preacher over that preacher. No, it's the same God that works in all, all the preachers. Everyone that truly believes the gospel and is able to teach, okay, we should pay attention and listen and see what we can learn because it's the same God giving you the lesson. It's the same God giving you the teaching from, because it should come from the Word of God. Now, one thing I just want you to quickly notice there in verses 4, 5, and 6 is we have a subtle introduction there of the Trinity. Did you notice that? Verse number 4, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit... And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. There are diversities of operations, but it's the same God which worketh all in all. I believe that's a reference to the Father. I believe just, just in these three verses, we have the Trinity. That just, that, that, you know, I don't really have a point to bring there, but I thought that was interesting. Look at verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man. See? You all have a gift of the Spirit. It's given to every man to profit with all. Why do we have gifts of the Spirit? Why does, why does the Holy Spirit work in us to profit? To profit you? To puff yourself up and make yourself look good? Absolutely not. It's to profit the body. Okay, The one body which we are, this one body the church, it's to profit one another. So if you are talented, if you're gifted, especially after salvation, not just a natural gift, and God's given you the ability to do something great for Him, you must always recognize that's to serve the body. That's to serve the Lord. That's to serve the church. That's to serve my brothers and sisters and not puff yourself up, okay? Edifying the church. Verse number eight. For to one is given by the Spirit. Now no, notice, now we get through a few of the gifts of the Spirit that are given to different people in the church, okay? For to one is given the Spirit, the word of wisdom. You know, some are wiser than others. You know, on, on Wednesday mornings, we get together, some of the men, right? We have coffee together and we go through chapters of the Bible. I, I don't lead that for you guys that aren't there. I, don't, I, let, the, I let the men lead that. And I, I, just, I just pipe in every now and again. But there is amazing wisdom in the men of this church. Okay, honestly, there are things that I just, I'm like, oh yeah, I never thought about. I just never saw how you can put that together. Or when I've had other people come up and preach, there's been things, oh yeah, I've never seen those passages like that. I've never put those passages together. And you know, you learn, right? People have different measures of wisdom. And I don't... Look, as we go through this list, I do believe a church bishop, okay, the pastor, ought to have a well-rounded, uh, you know, type of... Like all these gifts, they should, they should have a well-rounded amount of those gifts, okay? But there might be people in the church that have more wisdom. There might be people in the church that have more knowledge. There might be more people in the church that can even preach better. Like it... You know... Different people have different gifts, but I do believe as a bishop, if you're going to be someone that starts a church, you ought to be looking at how can I have a well-rounded amount of all these gifts so I can sort of profit the church in many, many ways. But look, for to one is given the Spirit, the Word of Wisdom, verse number 8, and another the Word of Knowledge by the same Spirit, okay? To another faith by the same Spirit. So some people have more faith than others. The Holy Spirit gives some people more faith than others. And I know of people that have greater faith than I do. Like, they have a greater vision of what God can do. They have a greater reliance on what God can achieve. When they pray, they truly believe, man, God's going to answer this. I've seen people like that. And it seems like, man, they seem to get their prayers answered all the time. They have a greater amount. Now, we all have faith. Okay, if you didn't have faith, you wouldn't be saved, right? First of all, you've, you've put your faith on Christ. But we go from faith to faith. We live by faith. But some people, by the Holy Spirit, have a greater measure of faith. Okay, and if you're someone that has a greater measure of faith, use it for the Lord. Use it, okay, because uh, that's what the Spirit has given you. Look at it, and then to another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Now, I don't believe that gift exists today where someone can come and, and just heal someone on the spot. Okay, we saw, you know, the, the Old Testament apostles come and just lift the lame. Okay, just make the, the, the blind to see, just like Jesus Christ did. 
just spontaneous on the spot. Okay? Now, I don't believe that exists today. And we do, and I'll, I'll tell you later on, but we do have a way that a church can, uh, can um, take action to heal someone that is sick. And I'll, I'll look at that later on. Uh, by the same Spirit, verse number 10, to another the working of miracles. Miracles. Something supernatural. Again, you, you might say a healing of sick, things like that. Or we saw Philip in the Bible just transported from one, thing, one area to another to speak to the, um, to the, uh, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. Okay? But who took him? Who transported him? It was the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. Okay? These are gifts of the Spirit. Okay? These are things that the Spirit has given the men the ability to do. To another, prophecy. Okay? To another, discerning of spirits. Some of you are greater discerners than others. Right? We might have someone come into the church... And because I'm the, I, you know, I'm the kind of person that likes to give everybody the benefit of the doubt, you know, I probably don't have that kind of discernment to straight away determine if someone's a false prophet or not. But some of you, you might have greater discernment than me, right? But then use that discernment and let me know if you're concerned about someone in the church, right? Some of you have greater discernment than others. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. We'll go into that soon. To another, the interpretation of tongues. Okay. Now, keep your finger in 1 Corinthians 12 and turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Because this is one of the things that charismatics get carried away with. They think they can speak in tongues. And they can speak in some kind of tongue. I don't know what it is, but it's not the tongues of the Bible, okay? So firstly, Acts chapter 2 verse 5. Acts chapter 2 verse 5. Now, the book of Acts and the book of 1 Corinthians are the main books that talk about the, the, the gifts of the Spirit. They're the main books that speak about speaking in tongues, okay? Now, just let's have a look at this. Acts chapter 2, verse 5. On the day of Pentecost, if you remember, the Holy Ghost came to the disciples and they had these cloven tongues of fire above their heads. And all of a sudden, they could speak in tongues. Now, let's quickly look at this in verse number 5. So these disciples go out and start preaching in tongues, okay? Verse 5. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven, this was a time of Pentecost, so the Jews throughout the world came to Jerusalem to partake of the celebrations of the past. Of, sorry, of of, Pente, uh, uh, of um, Pentecost. Okay, um, so they came from every every part of the earth. So they came speaking different languages. There were people of all nations and all tongues. Okay, verse number six. And when this was, and by the way, before I read that. I often hear people say, man, the Jews, they kept themselves like pure. Like the Jews are this pure race of people. They never intermingled. And yet what do we see in the book of Acts? They're all over the world, right? They're, I mean, they're, they're, they've spread already. This is before the temple was even destroyed. Before they were scattered and taken out of the, uh, out of the land of Judah, they were already throughout the whole world. They were already intermingling with people of all nations. Okay? Anyway, verse number 6. And when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. So these 120 disciples are going out preaching and yet everybody under every, every, from every nation, from every tongue, can hear the, the preaching in their own language and they're confused. They thought they came somewhere where they were preaching Aramaic or Hebrew, whatever the main languages were in that time. Verse number 7. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these speech which speak Galileans? So how do these Galileans, Galileans, how are they able to speak all these languages of the whole world? Verse number 8. And how we hear every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. Now where were they born? <laughs> Again, these all nations across the world, right? Now it gives us now a list of all the different nations and different tongues that they were speaking in tongues. Because tongue, yes, it's your tongue, but it's also, it, al it also means language, you know? Now, in Spanish, one way to say, to say la uh, language is idioma, but an older way of saying it is lengua, which is language, where you get language from. It, it's just what, what tongue you speak, you know, your tongue is language. It's the same thing, okay? And then look at verse number nine, pa pa uh, Parthians and Medes, I'm just gonna I'm gonna try to count my 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 hand how many that we see how many languages we see there Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea so we still have your native tongue there and 
Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia. That's eight, I'm counting. Verse number 10. Uh, Pi, uh, Phrygia, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Nine. And Pamphylia, in Egypt. So Egyptian, that's 11. And in the parts of Libya, about Cyrene, so that's 12. And strangers of Rome, so I guess Italian, that's 12. Jews and proselytes. And Cretes and Arabians. So that's, that's, that's at least 14. I don't know, I'm not sure. I've, I've, I've lost how many fingers to count there. But at least 14 languages. We do hear them speak in our tongues. What? The wonderful works of God. What are they, what are they preaching? The wonderful works of God. They can understand what they're hearing, right? And again, you look at the modern day charismatic Pentecostal movement that say they speak in tongues. Can you understand what they're saying? No. Can you confirm that they're speaking wonderful works of God? No. In fact, they could even be cursing Jesus Christ in whatever tongue they speak. We don't know. And if they are, then they're not of the Spirit of God. And they definitely aren't the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God spoke in tongues that men could understand. Tongues that men could interpret. Because that was one of the spiritual gifts that we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That was another gift. Being able to interpret a tongue. Now, go back to 1 Corinthians 12. Actually, yeah, go to 1 Corinthians 13. Because I want to show you this. So all these, these amazing miracles, these gifts of the Spirit, started on Pentecost, didn't they? Now, I'm saying to you that a lot of these gifts, like, like speaking in tongues and healing the sick, like, you know, on the spot, spontaneous, like that, do not exist today. Um, or people add in more words to the Word of God, okay? Or like new prophets add in additional wo uh, words of the Word of God. So turn to 1 Corinthians 13. I just want to show you this. So one chapter over from 12. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8, okay? I'll just, we'll just read one verse here. Paul says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Now remember, one of the, one of the gifts was the spirit of prophecy, he says, that's going to fail at some point. And then whether there be tongues, being able to spontaneously speak in another language without having, having learned it, they shall cease. Okay? Whether there be knowledge, remember the, the, the word of knowledge, I think it said? It shall vanish away. There are certain gifts that will disappear. Okay? Once the apostles are done with, because we know the apostles must be someone that have seen the resurrected Jesus Christ, once that period of time in the church was done away with, so would certain um, gifts of the Spirit. Okay, now we're going to go into that next, next week in verse 13 or on Thursday. I'll probably preach about that, about that on Thursday when I get back. Okay, but I just want to confirm to you, yes, the Bible confirms there's going to come a time when these gifts are done away with. Okay, back to verse number 12. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit divide into every man uh, severally as he will. This is the will of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a will. Yes, the Holy Spirit is not just a power of God. He's a person of the Trinity. He has his own will. And according to the will of the Holy Spirit, he gives every person a gift of the Spirit. Okay? At least one or more. Okay? Again, just confirming that it comes from the Holy Spirit. Verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. How many Jesus Christ are there? There's one. There's one body of Christ. And in the same way, the church represents, now that Christ is, has gone to heaven, the church represents the body of Christ. And because it represents the body of Christ, it is still the one body. And you might say, but Kevin, there are many churches. Yeah, we'll get into that in a minute, okay? I'll explain that to you in a minute. Uh, so, you know, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we break that bread, we're remembering the body of Christ. We remember that physical body that was sacrificed for us. But on this earth, this church, the church in Caloundra, is operating as the body of Christ. Okay, he's left us his work to continue. He's left us his work to do. He came to save sinners and that's why the ministry of reconciliation is for all of us. Because we continue the great commission that Christ has left us, which is preaching the gospel, getting people baptized, and teaching them to observe all things that's found in the scriptures. Okay, so we operate as the body of Christ. Think about the responsibility that we have. Okay, if we think about if Christ was here on the earth and all the things that he would be doing, that's what we're meant to be doing. Because we are now the body of Christ that has, now that he's resurrected into uh, heaven. 
So, look, let's look at verse 13. For by one Spirit... Now, I'm not going to explain verse 13 just yet, but I want to read it, and I want you to think about it. For by one Spirit, we are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Now, I won't explain that just yet. But people struggle with the idea, what is the difference between the body, the one body, and the church? Okay? Now, I don't know if you've, you've got your thoughts. I'm going to tell you what I believe, and I think it's pretty sound. If you have a different opinion, you can let me know after the service. But there are a few things that we need to understand. There is one body, right? And many churches. There's not one church on the earth. There are many churches, but there's one body. Now, I just want you to think about this because, again, verse 12 and 13, what we just read, confirmed that there's one body. Okay? That's a fact. Fact number one is that there is one body. Okay? Now, quickly turn to 1 Corinthians 11. So just go back a, a chapter. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 16. It, it says here, But if any man seem to be contentious, this is talking about the issue of hair, the length of hair, we have no such custom, neither the, what's the next word? Churches of God. Is there one church? No. There are churches of God. And the church in Caloundra is one of the churches. Okay? There are many other churches of God throughout the world. Okay? So there are, fact number two is that there are many churches, plural. One body was fact number one. Many churches is fact number two. Now turn to Colossians chapter one. Colossians chapter one. Colossians chapter one and verse 18. Let's get a third fact. Let's get a third fact in this. Colossians chapter one, verse 18. Colossians chapter one, verse 18. Talking of Christ, and he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Look at verse 24. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you to fill up, fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. So fact number three, what is the church called? The body of Christ. But how can that be? There's one body, many churches, but then the church is the body? So is there one church or is there many bodies? What's the, what's the go? Okay, let me explain this to you. Um, let, me, let me first start off how people get this wrong. Okay, people, When you start with fact number three, that the church is the body, then you're going you're gonna to get messed up. Okay, When you start with that fact. Now that's a true fact, but if you start with that, you're going to get confused. So for example, the, think of the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? They recognize that there's one body. Yeah, they, they recognize that but then they don't recognize that there's many churches. They see themselves as the one true church. They believe in one church and one body. If there's one body in their mind, there must be one church. Okay? Even though there's many Roman Catholic churches, they all see that as one church. And that's where the idea of denominations come from. There must be one church, so we must all be physically linked up somehow to that one church. Whether you attend that church or not isn't a big deal for them. As long as you're somehow registered, you get, you get christened in their church, you know, now you're part of that one church, the Roman Catholic. Now, now, the Roman Catholic Church is not a true church of God, just to begin with, but I just want to show you how they mess this up. They don't recognize many churches, but they, yeah, there's one body. They, they get that right, that there's one body. They get that right, okay? So... The other problem this creates is not just a denominational structure where there's men above churches, which Christ is the head of the church, right? And then they end up having a pope right at the top of that. But then because if you go back to 1 Corinthians 12, go back to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, we saw in 1 Corinthians 12, verse, verse, verse 13, it says, For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, and then uh, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made all to drink into the one spirit. This is about salvation. Okay? The baptism here is not water baptism. Let me just say that to you now. It's not water baptism. It's being baptized by the Holy Ghost. The moment you partake of that one spirit, that you drink of that one spirit, then you've been baptized into that one body. Okay? This is a spiritual baptism of the Holy Ghost. This is not water baptism. Okay? But because, and this is this, because this ties into salvation, and they believe, the Roman Catholics believe their one church is the one body, and to be saved, you must be part of that one body, then they believe salvation 
is in the church. Right? They believe because you must be saved into that and, and put into that one body, which to them is the Roman Catholic Church, the only way to be saved and be sure of heaven is to be part of the Roman Catholic Church. Do you see how when you start with the wrong part, you can get messed up? Okay? But you know, the Protestants and even Baptists and even independent fundamental Baptists also make a similar mistake. Again, they start with fact number three. The body is the church. They start with that again. But this time, they recognize there are many churches. So then they say, oh, well, there's one body. Many churches, so there must be many bodies. All right? Now, look at verse 13 again. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. Again, they look at this. So for them, the body is the, is the, is the local church. Many, many churches. And then they look at verse 13 and say, for, for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Well, how can we be... They recognize that this is not salvation in the church. Okay, because most Protestants and even Baptists, obviously we don't believe that you, to, you need to be part of a church to be saved. That's more of a Roman Catholic thing or the cults believe that, that kind of stuff, okay? But they recognize, oh, so baptism, they think of that as water baptism. Okay, so to join the church, we must be water baptized, that's how they see it, into the one body, okay? Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into that one spirit. So then, because we're, okay, if I baptize them, we know we need to baptize people, so if I baptize them, they're now part of the church, they're now part of the, they're a member of our church. That's how they understand it. And so that's why they delay baptism so many times. Well, we can't just baptize someone because now they're part of the church. We need to make sure we go through the 10-week 10 10 week training course so they can at least understand all the core doctrines before I baptize them. Okay? And then they're afraid. They're afraid to baptize someone because they think now they're part of my church. Well, no. Let's say you can take it to that extreme as well. And they still have denominational structures, but it's not so much a physical denomination, it's a spiritual denominational structure. They think, well, you know, because... And, and that's why some churches recognize the baptism of certain Baptist churches that they like, but then they don't recognize the baptism of other Baptist churches that they don't, they don't like or they don't, they don't recognize. Because they've got this spiritual denomination in their head that it's got to go all the way back to John the Baptist and I need to make sure my church belongs to John the Baptist and all the churches that I accept people that come to my church is part of the John the Baptist. And if I'm not sure if that church is part of John the Baptist, then I'm going to ask them to get re-baptized even if that person was scripturally baptized to begin with. In their head, they still have this denomination. You know, but it's a spiritual one all the way to John the Baptist. You see the mistake you can have when, when you start with fact number three? Fact number three is true, but you, you, you make a mistake starting this. So let me explain this to you. Let me explain how this works. Fact number one, there's one body. And as we can see in verse 13, to become part of that one body, we are baptized by the Spirit. We're, we're, we're born again. We, be, we believe on Jesus Christ. What that means is every believer, every true saved person is part of this one body, this one spiritual body of Christ on this earth, okay? But that one spiritual body is not the church because there are churches. Church is a physical congregation of believers. It is a lo what we have right now. This is a local congregation of believers. We're gathered together physically because what does church mean? It means congregation. It means assembly, Okay? Are we congregated with everybody, every believer in the world? Are we assembled with every believer in the world? No. Okay, Matthias, come up here. Now, Matthias, Matthias is saved. Let's say he is, he's not part of any church. He is part of the body of Christ. Okay? But is he part of a church? No, he's not attending any church. But if Matthias joins a church, he's still part of the body of Christ, but now he's also a member of a church, okay? So both those things go together. You can sit down, okay? I just, just want to illustrate that a little bit to you, okay? Now, how do we then understand, just think, think of that example there with Matthias, how do we then understand that the church is the body as well? Well, because if the church is a local congregation of believers and believers are that one body, then the church can rightly be called the body of Christ, okay? It's rightly a church, but it's also rightly the body of Christ. You see that? So we can maintain these three facts. Fact number one, that there's one body, which is a spiritual body. And some people take, you know, the universal church. I don't believe in the universal church, okay? No. I'm just saying, but spiritually there's one body. 
Then secondly, there's physically a congregation of believers of many churches, not just one church, many churches. But because churches are made up of people that are the body of Christ, a church is rightly called the body of Christ. Now, I'll prove this a little bit further. Let's keep reading in verse number, let's have a look, verse 14. 1 Corinthians 12, 14. 1 Corinthians 12, 14. For the body is not one member, but many. Okay, the body is not one member. And we'll see soon what this means. 15. For if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? So even though the foot, your foot is not your hand, it is still rightly the body. Okay? The foot can't say, well, I'm not the hand, so I'm not the body. No. The foot and the hand is the body. Okay? It's of the body. And so, if you look at it that way, the one body of Christ that is spiritual, and then we have the church, which is a subset of that, a physical congregation, then you can't just say, well, I'm not the whole body, therefore I'm not the body. You are the body. Okay? The hand is as much the body as the foot is the body. Okay? Now, let's, let's move on. Let's look at verse 16. If, if I haven't made that clear, please ask me after the service. Verse 16. And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? So again, it's just, just the same kind of principle there. But uh, look, the foot, hand, ear, and eye are all important members of that one body. You need all of it. Okay, you need all of it. You know, the hands, it gets the work done, right? Usually when you get work done, you do it with your hands. But then does the foot say, well, I don't get the work done, so I'm not important? No, the foot gets you from location to location. Okay, now I know a foot can stink and sweat and can get dirty, probably the easiest part of your body that gets dirty. But if not for a foot, man, you're, you can't get anywhere. It's, it's still important, okay? And the ear, you know, if you're, if you're like a person in the church that's an ear, that means you're a good listener. Sometimes people just need to vent. Sometimes people just need to, you know, get things off their chest. And if you're someone in the church that is a good listener, you can serve the body as well by just, by just listening, by being the ear. But then the eye, what about an eye? You can be someone that's very discerning. We saw that as one of the spirits, right? Being watchful, being, you know, making sure that the church is safe and taken care of. And again, I, I, I believe a bishop of a church should have all of these qualities about them, okay? But some people are going to have a greater measure of that quality about them, a greater measure of that spirit. So we're all given different roles and, and gifts to serve in the church, to edify the church. And let me just say this, when you're missing in church, we've had, we've had many weeks where people have been missing, and it's not your fault, you know, I know the whooping cough and all that kind of stuff, right? But still, even with legitimate reasons, we can't function to our full capacity when people are missing. Everybody in this church is important, not just me. Okay, and this is the thing I want you to take home with you at least, you know, by the end of this. This is not Kevin Sepulveda's church. Okay, this is not the church of the Sepulveda's. This is your church. We are one body, okay? And if you want this body to succeed, then you need to contribute. You need to do your part. And if you have some brilliant ideas, don't think, well, Kevin's going to come. I don't know. You, you probably have been given the gifts of knowledge. Like, you probably have the great ideas of what we can do in the church, greater ideas. Just come and tell me. Run and buy me. Hey, you, you know, it's all good. It's one body. It's one church, okay? This is not just my church. This should be everybody's church. How can I help? Whether young, whether old, whether you've got a foot that works or not, doesn't matter. What can you do to serve in this church? And, you know, I remember Trish, you know, where Trish came, you know, when we were meeting still in the shed, and what Trish is like, well, I can make cards, you know, and she brought, you know, a bunch of cards, you know, we can use for birthday cards, Christmas cards, whatever. Hey, that's serving the church. That's saying, hey, what can I do to help this body? So, you know, just anything. Think about what you can do and serve in. Hey, I'm happy to, for you to bring those gifts to the church. Verse 17, 1 Corinthians 12, 17. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the, ho if the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? So this, again... If, if we all had the same gifts, there'd be something missing. It's like if your whole body was just an eye, like every part of your body was an eye, then how can you smell, right? How can you hear? You know, everybody needs to uh, contribute, just like the members in your body do different things and serve you in different ways. Hey, the same way people in this church ought to uh, serve one another. Don't think, man, I wish I had that person's gift. No, God's given you that gift on purpose 
so you can serve in your way. Verse 18, But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath pleased him. Again, don't be envious of somebody else's gifts. Because look at verse 18. But now have God set the members, every one of them, in the body. So the reason you are part of this church is because God has set you here. You think, man, I had a decision to be part of this church. No, God set you in this church. God set you here. And have a look at why. As it hath pleased him. The reason you're in this church is to serve this church. And God's put you here because it pleases him. Okay, you thought it was your, your, your whole idea to come and join the church in Calandria. No, God's put you here for his purposes because it pleases him. Verse 19. And if they were all one member, where were the body? And now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the Lord, I have no need of thee. Sorry. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Okay, so can my hand say, I don't need your foot? Can my eye say, I don't need your ear? No, I mean, for the body to function, every part of you needs to be there. Now, the reason I believe Paul wrote this in this chapter is, again, remember this church. This church was divided, okay? This church had schisms. This church had favoritisms, okay? And he's saying to them, look, you can't say that I don't need this, this other person in the church, because they're there for a reason. God's put them there for a reason to serve the church. And we should never get to the point where we think, hey man, look at me, look how I serve the church. You know, that other person in the church, we don't need them. That is, that is devilish, okay? Because God's brought them here for a reason. Every one of you are important. No matter how much or how little you can do, it's something you can do to edify this church. Just your presence edifies me. Just you being here edifies me. Honestly, it does, Okay? No one is more important than the other. We're all just as important. We all have different roles. We all have different spirits, like gifts of the Spirit, I should say. But it's all the same Spirit of God that's given us that ability to work. Okay? Verse 22. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. So there are parts of your body that you think, man, I don't really need that, yet it's necessary. Um... Christy, you had your gallbladder removed. You know what? Yeah, it seems feeble and unnecessary, but it was, it's kind of necessary <laughs> right, for the rest of us. Now, there's going to be a part that you won't be able to function fully in, in, in capacity of your body. Okay? But even the things that can be removed and you can still live, hey, there was a purpose for that. God had a purpose for that in your body. Okay? And you might say, hey, I'm just a gallbladder in the church. Hey, you're still important. <laughs> okay? Yes, we could remove you. Yes, we could still function. But there'd be a part of the body that cannot be, would not be functioning to its full capacity. Okay? What about, I think of Trish, your knee as well. Okay? I mean, how many times do you think of your knee? You know, when you get up in the morning, I'm sure you, you, you fix your face or whatever, you fix your hair, you wash your hands. How much thought do you give to your knees? And yet, you know, when, when, you're, when you have a problem with your knee, it, it messes up your mobility. Okay? It, it's, it makes it difficult to be in church or whatever, to do different functions. And yet, how much time do you give to the knee? But it's so important, right? Again, we have the knee, you can't walk, you can't get around, you can't be mobile. Verse 23, uh, sorry, yeah, verse 23. Uh, and those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, for our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. So when we understand even the parts of the body that, are, that seem that we don't think about, when we realize just how important they are, yeah, you know, they're made comely, they're made important, okay? And so every, no matter what you do, you pick up rubbish in the church, hey, that's important, okay? That's important. God's given you that gift to think of that, those things and do that kind of work. Verse 24, For our comely parts have no need, but God have tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked that there should be no schism in the body and that the members should have the same care one for another. So we can't say, man, Kevin, he's the pastor. You know, I'm going to give him more care. I'm going to give him more, uh, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to serve him more because he's the pastor versus someone else in the church. No. And I apologize. Let me just I apologize right now. If, if, if you feel in this church, why doesn't Kevin speak to me? Why doesn't he spend more time with me and talk with me? I'm sorry. I, I don't mean that, okay? You're important to me. Okay? You're important to God, 
And, you know, I should spend my time with every one of you as much as I possibly can, okay? An equal amount of time because you're all important to me and you're all important to God, okay? And please keep that in mind for yourselves. You know, we don't want to create schisms. That's divisions. We don't want to create cliques in this church. And as we grow, yes, there are going to be people that you feel more comfortable to talk to. But please don't forget the other people that you haven't spoken to for a week or two. You know, we're one body. We work together. We function together. And when you know everybody in this church, then you'll have a better opportunity to serve one another because you'll know what their needs are and how I can meet those needs. Verse 26. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honoured, all the members rejoice with it. So if there's someone in our church that's suffering, going through a hard time, we all ought to suffer with them. We all ought to be thinking about them. And that's why we pray on Thursdays. We come together on Thursdays every week. Because every week there's new challenges. Every week there's new trials. Every week there's something that, you know, this isn't a perfect world. We're going to be struggling with someone. Maybe you are. Maybe you think, man, I had a great week. Hey, but there might be someone in the church that hasn't had a great week. And they need prayers. We come together. We pray. We mourn. We suffer together. Okay? And I appreciate, you know, when people use, you know, our, our modern technology messages. Hey, pray for such and such. Someone's going to do this or that. Pray for that. Hey, stop and pray. You know, we suffer together, we pray together. But not just that, we ought to rejoice together. In verse 26, for one member be honoured, all the members rejoice with it. Now here's what happens in so many churches, right? That, well, you know, the Bible college student, he gets honoured. Okay, the missionary, he gets honoured. Right, the people that are doing great things phys- visibly, they're the one that gets honoured and, and other people in the church feel, well, what about me? Well, look, first of all, if someone's getting honoured, we should all rejoice. Don't become envious of someone else's success. Someone's success is the whole body's success. Okay? If someone gets a pay rise or whatever, rejoice with them. Be happy. Don't think, well, what about me? That's what I should have had, Lord. Why didn't you give me that? Rejoice together. Mourn together. Suffer together. But rejoice together. Again, when we get someone saved... You know, let's share that news. Let's rejoice together. You might go, well, I haven't seen someone say for a whole month. Why did this person get someone say? Who cares? Rejoice! Someone's going to heaven. Okay? We're one body. We work together. Keep that in mind about our church. I want us united. I don't want schisms. I don't want divisions in this church. It upset me. It upset me. Honestly, I'd be so upset if there was ever, ever, you know, division. Now, look, again, sometimes you're going to get better along with, you know, along with people better than others but don't make that divisive, okay? Get out there, honour those that you think are least esteemed, whatever. Send those members that seem less honourable. We bestow uh, more abundant honour, verse 23 said. Okay, so even those that you think, oh man, I don't get along with them, hey, bestow them more honour because they're important members of the church. Okay, verse 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular, okay? Um, uh, I guess I, I kind of skipped around my notes, but this is where I was going to say, hey, this is not my church. This is our church, okay? Because uh, ye are the body of Christ. Ye, not me, or I am, but ye, all of us. All of us are the body of Christ. We don't come just because Kevin's here. We come because this church is a body. You're all important parts of that body. Verse 28, And God hath set some in the church... Now notice this, this is, a, this is an important verse here. And God have set some in the church, there is a hierarchy here that's listed, okay? From, from what's important to have in a church to, uh, down to the bottom. Now, it says here, God have set some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, the gifts of healing, helps governments, diversities of tongues. Notice how tongues is right down the bottom. <laughs> now, first of all, I mean, look, speaking another language is great, like just spontaneous being able to speak another language. And doing miracles, I mean, you'd think someone that was doing miracles, you know, let's say there was a dead tree and, and Callum walked up to that tree and made it, all the leaves budded and all the flowers came. You'd think, wow, look at that miracle, look what Callum did. And you think, man, he ought to be first in the church. No, <laughs> that's low in the priority, okay? First apostles. Now, we already know that the apostleship is over. Okay, but we do have the writings of the apostles in the Bible. Okay? Secondly, prophets. 
Are prophets important? Yeah, they were the next important. Now, there is a different difference with New Testament prophets than there was to Old Testament prophets, okay? I guess, in, in a sense, I am a prophet. In a sense, someone that preaches the Word of God, that proclaims the Word of God, is a prophet, okay? Some people think, well, a prophet is someone that can tell the future. Well, that's a prophet as well, if they've been given that gift of God that we see about in the Bible. But not every prophet told about the future. Many prophets just preached the Word of God that God gave them. And that is what a New Testament preacher is. In a sense, they are a prophet. If you go and preach the gospel door to door, in a sense, you are a prophet. You are proclaiming the Word of God. Okay? Um, and then, uh, thirdly, teachers. People that are able to teach in the church. And then after that, miracles, gifts of healings, helps, governments. So some people have a gift of government. They can organize. Uh, you know, a church can have a government structure within it, you know. You know, um, we won't go into that right now. Um, helps someone that, you know, a g- helping is a gift of the Spirit. You say, well, I'm just, I'm just helping. Well, yeah, that's your gift then. Maybe you are able to recognize areas that you can help, and that is necessary in the church as well. But the thing I want to bring to your attention just quickly, the first three things. The apostles, we still have the writings of the apostles for us in the Word of God. The prophets, we still have their writings in the Word of God. Teachers, what do you teach? The Word of God, okay? The miracles, we, we can read about the miracles in the Word of God. The gifts of healings, we can read about that in the Word of God. And then you've got the helps, governments, and diversity of the tongues. And what we'll see later on, and this is what I truly believe, is that once the, once the Bible was completed, once the New Testament was completed, then that's when these gifts were done away with because we had the Word of God to our, uh, to our, uh, available to us. Okay, Because back then, the Corinthian church did not have a Bible. They did not have Genesis to Revelation like you have. They did not have everything available to them. So they needed the prophets, they needed the apostles, they needed these miracles to affirm those that truly were, had come from God. Okay? But now we know the Word of God is His Word. We know that Jesus Christ is the Word of God. We know Jesus Christ is the foundation of the church and uh, the head of the church. And we, we put the Word of God above His name, the Bible says. And so our authority comes from the Word of God. Everything that was made available to the Corinthian church, though there might be an outward physical miracle, is able for us to be read about and to learn about from the Word of God. We're going to cover that in chapter 13. Okay? Now the question might come, what about the gifts of healings? Turn to James chapter 5, please. James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Toward the end of your Bible. James chapter 5 verse 14. So wouldn't it be neat if someone could just come up and heal someone? You know, someone's got a, a bad knee and I could just come up and heal their knee and it's perfect. Well, that's been done away with, okay? But there is still a process that the New Testament church can do to deal with sicknesses, okay? Now, James chapter 5, verse 14. Now, I I believe this is about someone that is, like, severely sick, someone that's maybe even potentially could lose their life or whatever, okay? So I don't, because, you know, you get a cold, do we we apply James 5? You know, the little things that go around, do we we apply James 5? I want to read this to you because I want you to think about this if this is something you need, okay? James chapter 5, verse 14. Is any sick among you? Any of you are sick? Let him call, now notice this, let him call for the elders of the church. An elder is a pastor, a bishop. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. So the committed sins part is this. Some sins can get you sick. (laughs) Some, you could be sick because of your sins. That could be a natural consequence or the chastisement of the Lord that's been put upon, upon you through your sickness. We don't know now. Now, we don't, I'm not saying that everyone that's sick has committed sins and that's why. I mean, I, otherwise, we, we, some, how many of us got the whooping cough? I mean, you must be all doing exactly the same sins, right, if that was a reason. But hey, no. But if there are some sins that are causing that person to be sick, if you go through this process, then those sins will also be forgiven. So you obviously have to confess these sins to the Lord. But I just want to notice, this is something that the New Testament church is instructed to do. And I know many uh, IFB churches do this, but it's not something they do often. It's something that they do in a case where someone could literally die or someone just has has a chronic problem that just won't go away and it's really disturbing their life, okay? 
So if you're someone that thinks, hey, I would like to do this, well, look at verse number four again. Let him call for the elders of the church. It's not for me to come to you and say, would you like to go through this process? Would you like to be anointed with oil? No, let him come call for the elders of the church, okay? So if you're sick and you want this done, I want you to think about this, you know, and then it says, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So there'd be oil used, anointed on their head, and prayed for those sicknesses. And, I, you know, this is not some charismatic Pentecostal thing. This is something legitimate that we can do as a church. Um, I'm happy to do it if it's something you want to do. But again, it's something that has to come from you as someone who's sick. Okay, so anyway, I just wanted to throw that out to you because there is still a process that God has for, for a New Testament church, even though those gifts of the Spirit, of, uh, the gifts of the Spirit, or the healing has been done away with. Okay, back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 29. We're almost done. 1 Corinthians 12, 29. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No. <laughs> all right. So we can't be all of these one thing, okay? And again, I won't go into, I won't ex elaborate all of that. Well, actually, you know what? I will. I will elaborate a little bit on that. I'll just read to you a couple of passages. So I just want to get this in your mind. Because it says, are all prophets. Now, I quickly want to talk to you about prophets. I'll, I'll read these passages to you. Matthew 11, verse 13 says, For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. That's John the Baptist. All the Old Testament prophets were until John the Baptist. And I know, yes, Jesus was a prophet. Jesus was an Old Testament prophet as well. Yes, I, But, you know, we, we, we separate him because he's God, right? But just as, as a man, the Old Testament prophets were until John. Okay, we have further confirmation of this in Luke 16 16. It says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. So, Old Testament prophets finished, done away with. We're now in the New Testament. Okay, now, are there prophecies in the New Testament? Yes, there was in this time, the time of Pentecost, the time of the early church. Can you go back to Acts chapter 2? Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. So we already looked at this, how um, the disciples were given gifts, they were baptized by the Holy Ghost, they were empowered by the Holy Ghost, they were able to speak in many tongues, in many languages, they were able to speak of the great works of God, and the people were amazed. The people were amazed. And then they asked Peter, what's going on? And this is what Peter explains in Acts chapter 2 verse 16. This is what he says about what's, what took place on the day of Pentecost. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. So this was fulfilled, what the prophet Joel spoke about was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, in that early stage, okay? Now you say, well, how come the daughters are prophesying? Is it, is it okay for women to be preachers? Well, no, I mean, obviously not behind a pulpit to a church, but they can prophesy, they can preach the gospel. They can go door to door and preach, and that's what they were doing. They were going out to the public and preaching the gospel. That was, it wasn't just men, it wasn't just sons, it was the daughters as well. Daughters, pay attention to that, okay? Daughters, it's your job to preach the gospel just as much. But now I'm saying to you, it's been done away with now because we have the, the full Bible at our disposal, okay? But if we continue reading on this, verse 18 to 20, And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Look at this, 19, And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Look at verse 20. And the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. Now, you guys have got, heard about the preaching on the rapture. The day of the Lord, if you remember, comes after the rapture. Okay? And now look at that. It says, when the, when the moon shall turn into blood. It's when the sun and moon are darkened. Right? When's that? Matthew 24, after the tribulation. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not preaching on the rapture today. Okay? But this confirms... Because, look, any independent Baptist you talk to, anyone, will say to you, Acts chapter 2, 
is at least the New Testament church has already commenced. Some say it commenced in that chapter. Some say earlier in John chapter 20. Okay, but regardless of who you talk to, just universally, everyone accepts by Acts chapter 2, the church is already, the New Testament church is already in motion. It's already operating. Okay, and these gifts were given to those that commenced and started the early church. But notice the prophecy of Joel isn't just for that time. It leads up to the time the moon is, is, turns to blood. Do you notice that? On the last days, which is just before the rapture. So how can we say that the church, New Testament church, is not here for the tribulation? How can we say it's not here for the, for, for the, the moon going, turning into blood, going dark and sun moon going dark? How can you say that when it's the same gift that was given to the early church and I believe, and you might disagree with this, but I believe those gifts will come back right at the end when great exploits are done for the Lord. The Bible says that the gospel of the kingdom will go throughout all nations once again on the end times. And I believe the last generation of Christians will have a similar measure of these powers and gifts of the Holy Spirit prior to the rapture. Okay? So that's my evidence for it is that the prophet Joel doesn't just talk about the day of Pentecost, he's also leading up then to the end times, to the sun and moon being darkened and then us being raptured after the tribulation. Okay, so that's just another evidence for you that this is teaching for the New Testament church. If Acts 2 is enough, is good for the New Testament church, why isn't then uh, uh, chapter, verse 20? I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me, right? You can just split up the Bible like that and go crazy. Anyway, go back to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, we're almost done. Verse 30. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 30. Have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts. Now let me just say to you, covetousness is a sin. Covetousness is a sin that will get you kicked out of church. Remember that. But coveting something good is all right. Okay. Most often in the Bible, when you look at the word covet or covetousness, it is a sin. It is something done in the negative. But it just means desiring. And usually it means desiring something bad. Desiring just uh, being envious of other people, being, you know, not being content with what God has given you. But Paul says you can covet or you can desire the best gifts. Now, he doesn't tell us what the best gifts are. Because we saw that they were all important. They were all necessary. Okay? But whatever you consider to be the best gifts, he says to you this in uh, verse 31, And yet show I unto you a more excellent way. So whatever you consider to be the best gifts, Paul says, I'm going to show you a more excellent way, a better way, something more important than all these miracles, all these gifts of the Spirit. I will show you a more excellent way, which we're going to be reading about next week or on Thursday potentially chapter 13 he talks about the more excellent way and I will cover that later on but I hope that was a blessing to you guys Uh, let's pray